look at structures known as molecular machines. This corresponds to pages 116 to 122 of your evolution book. So far we've seen Darwin's theory of natural selection, essentially survival of the fittest, which says that individuals with an, a variation that gives them some sort of functional advantage are more likely to survive, therefore more likely to reproduce and pass on the genes for that variation to future generations. And so over time, we see populations shift slightly in allele frequencies. One example of that would be the Galapagos finches, where over a few years, the beak size on average increased slightly in response to drought conditions. And so then the question becomes, this process of small changes, could those small changes um, add up to big changes, macro level changes, if given enough time. In Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, he has this quote, if it could be shown that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And so that's what we're going to look at today, some complex structures that when you look at them, it's hard to imagine how they would have been constructed through these small incremental changes. Remember in our study of the cells, cells um, are often referred to as a small factory where we, there's lots of parts all coordinated, working together, each one with a slightly different function, but collectively helping the cell to maintain homeostasis. Well, the real way that cells carry out most of those functions are through proteins and specifically protein machines or molecular machines. And one of those machines that has been well studied is the machine that allows the flagella on a bacteria to move. So flagella, remember, in our study of cells, uh, kind of a long tail structure that a cell uses to move, to swim. And so this motor is something that spins the flagella around and at very high speeds and allows it to move. When you look at the parts here, you see that there are not only a lot of parts, but they um, really resemble the kind of motors that we construct as humans. Um, and so just looking at it, it has certainly a, an appearance of something that has been intentionally designed. As we look at the, the parts, we see that there are a lot of them. So structurally, at least 30 different parts are involved in building it, um, 10 more parts in making it move, and then 10 more parts that are involved um, in the assembly process. So the numbers might vary slightly from one type of bacteria to another, but the big picture here is that there um, are a lot of different things all required to uh, make this motor work. So the question then becomes, where did it come from? So natural selection certainly could preserve this machine once it was already established, because certainly having this has a functional advantage for a bacteria that's able to swim. However, how did it get constructed? That's the question. So if natural selection is something that, that produces small changes incrementally to produce large changes when you add up all the small ones together, how do you get something like this? Because in order for this motor to work, it has to have all of the parts. All 50 of those parts need to be there in order for it to be assembled, for it to be um, functional. And so how do you have a half-built motor? Um, where does that how does that happen? So if it's all or nothing, you know, where does this flagella motor come from? Because you can imagine that a bacteria that has a half-built motor that doesn't work, how does that provide a functional advantage and is preserved? It seems instead that that would be a disadvantage for that cell. There's a term that we use to refer to structures like these. We say that they are irreducibly complex, meaning that there are so many moving parts and all of them have to be there that this complexity 
is irreducible, meaning that it's all or nothing. You have to have all 50 or it doesn't work. And so um, that raises the question of where did it come from? If natural selection only selects for things with an advantage, where do you have an intermediate form with no function? How is that selected for? And therefore, how could you build this in this incremental, gradual, step-by-step -step process? The counter-argument to that, the theory of evolution says that maybe this flagella motor came from an already built part that was used for something else. And so we see some similarities between the flagella motor and um, ion pumps, so cell pumps. And, but things to notice here is that it has some of the parts, but not all of the parts. Um, so where do those other parts come from? Um, and how, where did the instructions come from to put it together? And so even if all 30 parts required did come from other things that were already built, um, there still has to be the information to coordinate those parts. Um, and so that still raises a question of where did it come from? There are also some studies that suggest that really it was a flagellum motor that then was reduced to become this ion pump, not the ion pump was added to, to, be, to become this flagella motor. And so there's still a lot of questions um, about this. And, and is that really a logical explanation for where this flagella motor came from? And so this week, we have focused on natural selection and just how much change can it produce. So remember, there's two main claims for Darwin's theory. First, that all life descended from one universal common ancestor. That's the question that we will look at next week as we evaluate evidence like fossils and homology. This week, we looked at what is natural selection and just how much change can it produce. What is its creative power?